So uh, I'm going to uh, make a few comments uh, in the beginning here, and then I'll turn to each of the panelists and see what additional comments uh, and questions they want to have. And I think as you'll see that uh, I and a couple of the other panelists at least uh, haven't been uh, immersed in the uh, eMERGE system. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to present here will be in the form of uh, questions uh, to prompt further discussions rather than uh, presenting an alternative view of how things uh, might be done. So next slide, please. So just a couple background comments about what makes children different and why we may want to uh, take particular emphasis uh, on this uh, uh, group of people. And obviously, health conditions impacting children are, are different in many respects from adults. Not entirely different. Both suffer from uh, asthma and atopic dermatitis, uh, et cetera, although the diseases may be somewhat different uh, between children uh, and adults. So obviously, the need to focus on kids and the health care conditions that affect uh, kids. And in addition, obviously, uh, many adult conditions may uh, be secondary both to genotype and exposure during childhood years, so there's a need potentially to focus on uh, kids in order to better understand adult onset conditions. Uh, a big issue, of course, is that serious health conditions in children are uncommon, and this will get, uh, I hope, to a little bit of discussion about the um, recruitment goals for kids within the system and uh, what would be adequate to, to study conditions that are less common than things like asthma or uh, ADHD. Uh, kids can be found to be at risk for diseases uh, years or decades in the future, presenting, of course, medical issues about return results. And obviously, children can't consent to participation in research uh, themselves. Older children can assent interesting process in and of itself, but obviously the need to engage parents and children in the educational process as well as the return of results uh, process. So giving results to, to me is different than giving results to me about my child. And so in parents' uh, parent-child relationship, of course, uh, is considered to be uh, uh, a vulnerable population and a vulnerable relationship to psychosocial impacts. So we want to be particularly careful about how we manage this type of information. Next slide, please. So here's a couple of questions, and really just keying off uh, Halkin's uh, uh, presentation uh, under the um, general category of obstacles to current research. And here I have the incongruity between adult and pediatric uh, data sets, uh, perhaps a need to clarify how pediatric and adult conditions are selected for uh, analysis uh, within the network. But basic question, and I, I took Bob's comments to suggest that perhaps there's not a need to um, have overlap uh, here or any increased synthesis of uh, uh, phenotypes that it's perfectly appropriate to focus exclusively on kids' conditions and perhaps uh, on adult uh, conditions and uh, overlaps where it may be uh, appropriate. Um, this last point really is a broader question, and I think the pediatric component is a newer component, and this isn't to, the folks have been enormously productive with this, but perhaps a larger background question is, given the rare nature of many pediatric conditions, given the need to have a diversity of participants in the network, uh, is the current network large enough with respect to pediatric uh, participants, and what are the thoughts about uh, uh, expansion if it's not uh, over time? Next slide, please. Uh, how can uh, emphasize the new approaches to existing data, copy number variants, uh, and good analytic tools uh, available, and really just uh, reiterating uh, Alkin's presentation here in order to prompt further discussion. Uh, do we, in fact, need better data on, uh, as he stated, frequencies and boundaries of CNVs and uh, in the database of genomic variation, uh, and can eMERGE contribute to uh, data on pathogenicity? Is the eMERGE network uniquely placed to uh, uh, fill in a significant gap about our understanding of uh, CNVs. Next slide. Uh, and prospective directions. Again, uh, uh, King up uh, Alkin's presentation, uh, where he presented the concept of a custom chip with bi spectrum clinically relevant variant uh, and CNVs, and uh, with the question about uh, uh, is the field ripe for a tool uh, of this uh, sort? Uh, how would this impact the nature of uh, testing and return results and informed consent and uh, the other types of uh, issues that the network has been uh, grappling with? Next slide. Um, 
So a couple of additional questions raised by uh, uh, panelists and some of our uh, interchanges. So this first bullet point really is a reiteration of that question about uh, phenotyping. Uh, second bullet, uh, should the eMERGE uh, uh, consortium consider more um, gene uh, environmental interaction data collection for children? Seems to me uh, to be uh, a particularly uh, uh, important and uh, potentially rich area for this network to uh, explore. Uh, what are the opportunities and barriers to collecting those sorts of data for um, uh, network analysis? Questions about potential unique issues with pediatric participants. Uh, we've had a couple of panels on uh, informed consent and return of results. I think some uh, obviously specific focus uh, to the extent that these issues are somewhat different uh, within families and within uh, pediatric patients, adolescent patients, uh, uh, et cetera. Return of results for adult onset conditions, results on certain clinical significance, uh, incidental findings we've talked quite a bit about. And this issue of uh, uh, when parents are uh, analyzed uh, or sequenced in order to better clarify a child's results, what are the issues that arise when uh, uh, the analysis uh, extends to family members in this way. Uh, I think my last slide. So other general questions that came up, um, and I think there was a reference to this a little bit earlier uh, today, so a real opportunity for uh, eMERGE potentially to um, work together with the uh, new newborn screening sequencing uh, projects and be mutually supportive there. Uh, and so I'd be interested in a little more information about what's anticipated in that regard. And then are there target conditions for genomic analysis that may have early clinical utility in healthcare children? Was a question that came up, and I think part of this, part of the implication is that uh, we're perhaps still looking for an additional proof of principle uh, example. Where's the lower hanging fruit in the, in the domain of uh, healthcare children that might be a significant focus here to demonstrate the uh, um, utility of the uh, uh, approach being used within the network. So I'm going to stop there, and then what I'm going to do is uh, run through our uh, list of uh, uh, panelists and see whether they have additional comments or uh, questions. So I'll start with John Harley. We collect um, a cent at the age of 13, and at the age of 18, uh, we uh, send a notice to participants in research studies about whether they would, now that they are considered adults, whether they would wish to continue their participation or not. If we don't get an answer from them, we leave it the way it is. If we get an answer from them, we respond uh, to the extent that we can to follow their wishes. And so that seems to be a fairly, the institution as a whole seems to be pretty comfortable with this approach. And it, uh, I think it's fairly standard across the pediatric research institution to do it this way. The, um, the how it has presented a lot of interesting discovery, which impresses me that there's uh, a gold to be mined left in the uh, in all the work that's gone in to doing the GWASs, and that we should uh, not ignore that. And there's a wonderful opportunity there. Um, and it is an incredible database that will yield for years to come. The uh, pediatric group has an, one of the best opportunities for finding the outliers that you were talking about before in the outlier, um, uh, in doing outlier analyses, especially for sequencing, the uh, severe phenotypes of children presenting with adult diseases early in life generally has a much higher genetic load and would expect to be a very high yield, small group, large odds ratio kind of, uh, of uh, ascertainment group with which to work. And uh, that seems to be a great opportunity for us. Um, the, there are uh, lots of issues with integrating the pediatric latecomers to the adult world of eMERGE. Um, and um, I personally had resisted the idea of having a pediatric work group that was separate because it would force us to integrate better. Um, and as a consequence, I'm now chair of the pediatric <laughs> work group. And, um, but, and we have this tendency to reproduce everything. 
that the adult side does. Every little issue that comes up is considered from the perspective of pediatrics, and then we end up duplicating the work without forcing ourselves <laughs> on the adult side in a way that, uh, that also encourages the adult side to come our direction some. So that's an issue that uh, will probably continue, but we will continue to remind the adults that we're here and that uh, it's an important uh, piece of uh, how, how we go forward and the, the pediatric groups offer some incredible opportunities. I mean, childhood obesity is rampant. It's almost a, a public health crisis. Uh, asthma is, is increasing in uh, frequency and involves millions and millions of uh, children and people at this point. Uh, bad allergies are a huge problem in the pediatric population. We have a different concentration of illnesses, uh, but many of them just linger into the adult world pretty pretty easily. And so um, we will we'll find phenotypes that, uh, that cut across and take maximum advantage. And then we'll also do phenotypes that uh, are pediatric oriented. There was, there was talk earlier about uh, the trouble with uh, using opiates. And there's a huge problem with uh, this fetal syndrome from uh, children with mothers who are addicts of, uh, of opiates. And so those children cost, well, live in our intensive care units and cost billions. And understanding how they respond and can, re can uh, recover from these things is really important. On the other hand, um, there's never been a GWAS of any kind done with appendicitis, which has a, what, 50% mortality rate and uh, is only cured by modern surgery. It, well, it's left untreated. It's left untreated uh -huh. in natural history. <laughs> <laughs> the natural history of this illness. 100 years ago. Uh, yeah. If you couldn't do an appendectomy in 30 seconds, you know, you were pretty much dead. And so, uh, so there's lots of interesting ways to interact and, and, and forward. I appreciate uh, how I'm going to the trouble of putting all that together that, uh, from our perspective. Well, John, this is Jeff. Let me uh, clarify with you what you had mentioned about the uh, when you send a notice out to uh, families, now adults of kids who have been enrolled, and you don't get a response. Well, how does the what's the network doing there? Uh, we leave it alone. We we tried to reach it. Uh, we made a, a good effort, and they stay in the system. We continue using their information and data into their adulthood. Now, do you consider them? Consented or just opt uh, op, not opted out, um, and uh, what, what, what are the implications for the use of the data there? So uh, we consider them still usable, whatever you want to call that, in terms of the language you'd like to use. Uh, they're not thrown out. Uh, no, no active, no active step was taken to eliminate them, and so you wouldn't. You might not recontact them. As, as an act as a consented participant yeah we can't reach them so recontacting them for consent for something else is not uh, is not uh, not an not issue to us. not an but issue it, but it might be so, so on the uh, on the top side we uh, uh, recontact everyone who turns 18 uh, <clears throat> maybe a success rate there is about 30. 30 percent but the other 30 35 the other uh, 65. Uh, basically, their data stay in the database, but nothing, nothing new gets added. But it gets just de-identified and state, stays there in the in the same way as we had it when it turned 18. Okay. This is Good. Mary. We, we have the, on that conversation a little bit more. We have the same thing at St. Jude. If you if we can't confirm that the patient wants to stay a subject after the age of majority, then they have to be dropped from the study. Well, that's, so it's quite different. Actually. That's right. Well, let me, let me uh, delay further conversation on that point, which I think is quite important. Uh, let's finish up with our panelists here and then get back to that discussion. Uh, so, Tracy? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Emerge Group for asking me to be part of this. It was a very interesting day. Um, I understood some of what you had to say and um, uh, enjoyed learning about it. Uh, appreciated my my uh, fellow 
panel members' uh, efforts. Uh, Bob, uh, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think Jeff emerged my comments into his slides perfectly, so I won't uh, won't uh, take up any more time at the end of the day here. But I will say I feel like emerge as a as an entity is uniquely positioned uh, to lead this uh, this translation of genomic information into pediatrics. Um, it will be harder. We've talked about all the the barriers that make it a little more difficult. Um, but um, I think uh, I, I, I'm excited about what I hear going on. I look forward to any or all clinical decision support tools showing up on my uh, PC at the office and um, look forward to ordering that custom eMERGE chip on the newborns. So I, I'm, I'm excited about where we're going. I think my comments have already been included and uh, look forward to other people's thoughts. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Cynthia. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Yep, yep, yep. yes, Hi. gotcha. Um, this is Cindy Powell from UNC, and I'm a clinical geneticist and a pediatrician, um, and I'm also one of the PIs here on our newborn screening uh, whole exome sequencing study. Uh, so I, I certainly think that um, to answer one of Jeff's uh, questions, that there's a, a great opportunity for eMERGE and this and our U19 project to share information. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that probably applies in some of the areas, uh, the other areas discussed today, uh, regarding return of results, is the FDA oversight. Um, and although we, I think we, we may be one of the sort of guinea pigs for this, but um, the FDA is asking us to submit uh, sort of a, a pre-application to determine whether we need a, a investigational device exemption for, for our study. Uh, in preliminary discussions with the FDA, we're, uh, it seems that it, it, it revolves around return of results. Um, uh, that are obtained through research, you know, whole genome sequencing, and um, you know, if they're approved in a CLIA lab, that likely will be okay. But I think you know that the jury's still out, and and we're waiting to find out, you know, how this is going to work. So I think going forward, this certainly can add, um, you know, cost, time uh, to uh, many of the research projects that are going to use uh, next gen sequencing. Um, in thinking about some of the, the um, areas of study, I, I've heard a lot about you know, what we think about the, the common disorders of childhood um, with obesity and asthma, autism already mentioned. But um, also, I'd, I'd like uh, people to consider uh, birth defects. Um, certainly, as a group, you know, one of the primary uh, conditions of childhood, and whether there would be some way to um, use the eMERGE network uh, to look and gather, you know, more data, whether it's um, GWAS or sequencing data about uh, birth defects, and uh, you know, thinking about the the National Birth Defects Project and the CDC, I think. You know, they're gathering um, DNA samples on, on patients that are being ascertained and getting a lot of great clinical information, but, um, you know, would probably welcome more uh, next generation in sequencing studies of, of these patients and, um, you know, utilizing their, their registry. Um, uh, I think, you know, one thing uh, is that um, the return of results, I think, is, is different when one thinks about the, um, the age group. And although, you know, there's a lot of overlap with incidental findings that would be, you know, considered for both an adult and a pediatric patient, I, I think we need to think carefully about the pediatric age group and going forward with this, um, you know, like, Heidi described for the Boston group, you know, we have a group at, at UNC that's looking at a return of results not only for our uh, adult patient population, research subject population, but also in pediatrics. And there's definitely a lot of differences. Um, and I think, you know, we need to think carefully about um, how we're going to, you know, 
use the data, but yet, you know, if there's certain conditions, for example, conditions that we wouldn't want to return um, to parents of a child, let's say, you know, if we're talking about Alzheimer's, but in the future should a treatment, you know, be found that's beneficial, that potentially could start at a young age or at least in early adulthood, we'd want some method to go back and, you know, obtain that information and, and return, try to, to return that information to, to families. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to comment on is, you know, in, in pediatrics, although we think of the the um, child as the patient, um, we are evolving to more family-centered care. And I think, you know, going forward, um, you know, thinking about how this family-centered care in the genomic age um, can be can be utilized and um, considered, and uh, such as, you know, if there's a, a condition that's identified in a child, such as an autosomal dominant condition, likely one of the parents has it, and whether, you know, putting those results. Um, into the parents' EHR would be, you know, beneficial and how one would go about doing that. So that's all I have. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. All right. I wanted to, uh, we have, I guess, about seven minutes or so. <clears throat> I wanted to pick up on at least two points and then open it up for whatever else uh, folks uh, have to say. I wanted to get back to this question of uh, reconsenting. Um, kids once they reach the age of majority. And I believe what OHRP has to say about that is that uh, reconsent is appropriate if the sample or data is still subject to ongoing research, but if you can get a waiver of consent if the ongoing research is considered uh, meets the criteria for a waiver, or of course you can de-identify the information. Uh, but my guess would be in this context, the identification, uh, since you're linking this to an electronic medical record, uh, would not be considered feasible. But maybe that's a question rather than a statement. Other thoughts on that issue? Yeah. The, uh, we have an I2V2 system that de we have de-identified patient records that are available for non-human subject research in our institution for any faculty member that uh, wants to explore those those data. Now, the in the narrative portion, in the, uh, there's uh, the, the cleaning that part is a subject of ongoing concern. But we have enormous amounts of data, a million records. I think Boston has almost two million yeah. records, and, and and I don't uh, chop situation is, is is similar. So we have lots of de-identified data that we can link to genomic data and have it all be de-identified. Well, well, so but actually, I mean, it, it, it speaks um, a little bit sort of naive as if de-identification de was a static property and it's black well, and white and stuff. In fact, we, identification. Yeah, and so what we know is that, you know, biologic data, especially <laughs> genomic data, is so inherently rich in attributes that even if it's de-identified, de re-identification risk never goes to zero. So the residual risk needs to be controlled with policy. And obviously, there's a whole large working group that pediatrics will grow to know and love as part of uh, eMERGE that's looking at quantitative de-identification science. But I do think the notion of that in the informatics community, that the idea that, that de-identification is some, as a safe wall that you can hide behind is, is gone now, and you just have to deal with uh, non-zero re-identification risks in any of these classes of data. So, so this is Larry. I'll, I'll play devil's advocate just a little bit. It seems to me that the entire focus of the eMERGE is to use existing electronic medical records to make large-scale genomics possible. And, and I agree strongly that diseases of children are worth studying, and that in fact that diseases, adult diseases which have their onset in childhood are more likely genetic. But one of the attributes of the eMERGE system is that you can identify 18 and 20 year one year olds that have the disease when they were 10, and you can get their DNA now. So why do you need to go and collect DNA on all of these five-year-olds and 10-year-olds? Now, newborn screening, I think, is a very different thing than whole screening. 
and probably the pharmacogenomics because little kids are not just small adults. And so if you want to if you want to get the biological correlates, you need that. But for many of the diseases, severe atopic hematitis, pediatric onset, uh, psoriasis, uh, why not just go out and find people that had it 10 years ago? I, you know, and, and I am playing devil's advocate. I do not, I do not fully think that uh, that uh, and obesity. I mean, come on, that you have you have records. You can go back 20 years and find kids that were obese at three years old. Uh -huh. But phenotyping them as a child, you don't have the you know phenotyping a reference back. Yeah, it's electronic hard to do. medical records. It's like they're a part of the life span. Well, yeah. it's yeah. a pediatric yeah. systems and an adult system. Yeah, so that is the other piece of it is that we're all at pediatric hospitals, so, and then they go on to someplace else. So coming back to, you know, so I have a child, I have a children, and there's a Brigham. So I have somebody at the Brigham identify, how do I go to children and get the medical records? You see what I'm saying? If, 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 if people are in the system that's longitudinal, like mm -hmm. Geisinger, Geisinger is a good example. But, but, the, but the, isn't, the, isn't the, the idea of the consortium to use electronic medical records for your phenotyping and not go out and, and, and weigh but a child? But what I'm saying, though, is if you get those, if you go to a different institution to get the medical records, okay. I, mean, I think that that's probably a big piece of the problem. But, I, I imagine you're at the VA. Imagine the VA with 85-year-olds trying to get, in 50 years, electronic medical records from their childhood. Yeah. Well, we're trying from the DOD and it's been going on for Or perhaps the more provocative notion in the era of telomere shortening, <laughs> that, you are, that, that the common wisdom of a static genomic complement that you keep from a childhood is in fact completely wrong, and it's really quite dynamic. So yeah, samples yeah, acquired... Yeah, you're enriched for a lot of children who have a lot of diseases, and picking those out of all of the adults, I think, it's much harder to do. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of very practical issues for sticking with them. I'm just playing. I think, so, so you're imagining that all those children stay fat, you know, and there's a lot of change between the age of three, when you have early childhood obesity, and the age of 21. Mm -hmm. A lot of those kids will get skinny. But Larry's point is, you have to study that. Well, you can't study them, you well, you can't study them if you're ascertaining on being fat. But no, you ascertain them on like, fat at age three. Oh, and how do you do that as an adult? When are you going to get that information? Yeah, I mean, people don't remember. People you don't remember. Walk up there. Yeah, and you're not about oh, questionnaires. I'm talking about electronic medicine. You use state stamps on records at right. the time of service when they measure them. That's, when, mm -hmm. that's how you determine it. But, but I think you, the point is those records that go way, way back. Sure. But, but and, and we can identify some individuals who are, for example, in our biobank at CMRC, that were obese children, right? Okay. But but uh, our average age is something like 52 or something like yeah. that now. Okay. So even if we go back 30 years, we're we're not right. we're not covering that. So you're saying you can't do it? We don't have the sample bus. And we very few we, adult we records are not not eating electronic. We very few adult EHRs ask you were a little fat three year old. No, I, I, yeah. <laughs> so maybe we need to thank you for the provocative question. We've got two, about a, two more minutes for this panel. So are there are there other issues that we want to address? I think if you're going to you know, think about research studies, then that might be the case that you can you know, ascertain adults who are fat when they were younger. But if you're going to talk about clinical utility of any of this, the pediatric age population is the time that you want to intervene. I have an off-the-subject issue that we have the opportunity to bring to the clinic new technologies that haven't uh, been, that haven't really made it to uh, clinical utility in, in the way that we imagine they will in the future, like methylation. You know, the methylation yeah. patterns that you talk about in yeah. childhood are going to be cool. substantially yeah. different in adults, and those methylation patterns are partially inheritable, are partially heritable. You can tell if your grandmother smoked from your own methylation pattern in, from a population basis. And so I think there are tech, genomic technologies that we have not applied yet in eMERGE that will obviously be, that look, show every promise, I should say, show every promise of becoming clinically important. And we should prepare ourselves for being able to apply those when the research shows that they are clinically relevant. 
like methylation patterns. So is that where the merge should be built? I think it's one of the where one of the places we should prepare ourselves to take advantage of that for specific for specific clinical issues when the research supports the uh, the methylation patterns being important. Methylation patterns interacting with the genes we have is an obvious ways an obvious way of 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 leveraging the GWAS studies that we've already done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So, so we're now at the stage. I just want to be sure, um, Jeff Bodkin, did you have anything else that you wanted to uh, to comment on in the pediatric panel? Nope, all finished. Thanks very much. Great, thank you.